from uh, anyone has questions from last week uh, or the last couple of weeks as we've been talking about Luther on prayer, uh, then please post those up uh, below. And otherwise, let's dig right into it. Let me hit the share screen button here. And we are still on um, uh, Genesis chapter 25, uh, working on... Let me just adjust. I got a couple of quick adjustments here. Uh, working on verse mm, 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now a couple of maybe just a, a textual note uh, as well. I think we've talked about this before, but whenever you see uh, Lord with all capital letters, we know that we're dealing with the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, so that's there. And also the other thing to, um, to note is that um, I'm using the New King James here, so if you're in the New King James or in the King James, whenever you see one of these words in italics like this, that is normally there um, because the word is not in the original, so here in, in the Hebrew, it, but it's kind of needed for the sense of the Hebrew. So if you were just translating very literally from the Hebrew, if, well, why, this. And so the uh, the translators will just add in all is, what, am I like, was, especially. The, these uh, being verbs are often unnecessary, both in Greek and in Hebrew. And so they're added in there. It's one of the nice uh, features of the King James and the uh, and the New King James, so that's great. So we're but we're talking about theologically. We're talking about um, Isaac pleading with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Remember, for twenty years, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. And we're talking about this struggle of prayer. That's really what we're highlighting um, in Luther's works. Uh, we ended with this phenomenal. Uh, assertion from Luther last week, I fully believe if we devote ourselves to prayer earnestly and fervently, we shall prevail upon God to make the last day come. And we had a great conversation afterwards about what it means to prevail upon, to prevail upon the Lord. Let's make note here of the importance of intercession. So there's different words that the Bible will use for prayer. I mean, prayer is one, uh, supplication, intercession, thanksgiving, and so forth. But this idea of, of um, praying for somebody is, um, is really important. So, so as we intercede, so this is prayer for, what we call intercession, that this is one of the great offices uh, that we, in, in fact, it's probably the chief role of the prophets is to intercede, to pray for people. And it's one of our great offices as well. There's two times when Jesus commends someone more than anybody else, and that um, commendation comes because they are pleading to the Lord for other people. So we'll remember the Canaanite woman who comes pleading for her daughter, and Jesus doesn't answer her, and then greater faith I have never seen in Israel. And the same thing for the, uh, for the centurion who comes pleading for his servant. It's also one of these things to remember that that Jesus, as we pray for people, we bring them to the Lord. That's coming up, uh, and we'll see it in a few minutes. Okay, so we'll press on now. I uh, let me see if I can figure out what page. If you're following along in the book, we're in Luther's Works, Volume Four, page three hundred and forty. In the same way, Rebecca took refuge in earnest and persistent prayer and sighed anxiously night and day. Uh, Isaac, too, prayed for her and placed before God nothing else than that one trouble. Now, this idea here of placing things before God, that prayer is, is we're carrying to the Lord our troubles, our concerns, and we're putting it. But there's a, there's a thing here where Luther is talking about the... the um, the carrying to the Lord our own troubles, and that there's a sort of a unity in that prayer. For 20 years, this is like the, the prayer that Isaac is bringing. This one trouble, his wife's barrenness. 
we should learn from this that all our troubles, even those that are physical, should be placed before God. But above all, the spiritual needs. So that we are praying for the Lord for daily bread, our physical condition, and also thy kingdom come, physical, uh, spiritual things. So Isaac prayed in this way. Now this is, of course, Luther reading into the text, kind of bringing what his own understanding to flesh out the background. And this is where we see how um, this, this imaginative but theological reading of the text is happening here. And this is one of the reasons why it's so rich. So Isaac is praying how? Uh, if, it means, if it means hallowing of thy name, and if it tends to preserve thy kingdom, give Rebecca offspring. So look, look at how uh, Luther is assuming that Isaac knew the Lord's Prayer, which is really quite wonderful. If, uh, hallowed be thy name, the first petition, and if it tends to preserve thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, give Rebekah offspring. So where we don't have a promise from God, prayer steps in with its hopes and its, and its ifs in some ways. So... Um, so, so, in fact, Luther says that where a promise is lacking, as Rebecca lacked it, remember Isaac had the promise that he would have children, but Rebecca didn't have that promise. So, so the Lord, so, so Isaac can't come to the Lord and say, Lord, you promised Rebecca would have children, so grant her children. No, because he didn't promise that. Uh, where, where promise is lacking, prayer should supply this and should come to the rescue. Now notice if we have a if we don't have a promise, the prayer has is conditional. If. If. Like Jesus teaches us. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if it means that your name would be hallowed and your kingdom would come, then grant this thing. So when we whenever we're praying for something that we, we're not sure the Lord has promised, for example, if someone's sick. The Lord hasn't promised that everybody who's sick will get better. So we pray, Lord, if it's your will, if, you, if it means hallowing your name, if it means your kingdom coming, grant health and healing. Okay. Prayer supplies this where the promise is lacking. Kind of prayer steps in. But this is a difficult thing and requires great exertion. Now this difficulty of prayer... Um, I, I'd love to hear your comments on this and your thoughts about the difficulty of prayer. Because the difficulty of prayer has been noted oh, for, I mean, from, from the beginning. I, I remember uh, Dr. Kleinig was talking about, he, he would used to quote the Desert Fathers that, that, that say, the Desert Fathers said, and I, I just found a Desert Father book the other day, I got to find this, that they said, prayer is warfare to the last breath. Or C.S. Lewis would talk about the difficulty of prayer and how prayer is the um, one of the most difficult things of the Christian life. Uh, I know that whenever I go to confess my sins, I'm always confessing my failure in prayer, in the life of prayer. And so we can acknowledge that prayer is difficult, and it requires great work and exertion. It's far more difficult than preaching the Word or the other duties in the church. This is true. Um, when we teach, we experience more than we do, for God speaks through us, and it is a work of God. But to pray is a most difficult work. Therefore, it is also very rare. This is a call to prayer a call to exertion in prayer, a call to the work of prayer, etc. I'd love to hear you guys, uh, to bounce something uh, off of you here, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Luther's saying here. But we'll, uh, let me continue for just a second here. Hence, it's something great for Isaac to have the courage to lift up his eyes and hands to the divine majesty 
and to beg, to seek, and knock. Remember last week, this was one of the great things that Luther was talking about, the difference between asking, seeking, and knocking. So we ask in prayer. If the Lord doesn't answer, we seek to see where the Lord answered prayers like that in the Scripture, and then we are persistent in prayer. So we ask, seek, and knock, for it's something very great to speak with God. It's also something great when God speaks with us, but this is more difficult. So there, there's the, 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 the pattern here is, so the Lord speaks to us. Whoops, that's a wrong color. That's not a blackboard. It's an orange board. So the Lord speaks to us, um, and that's the Word of God. And then we speak to the Lord, and that's prayer. And and Luther says, look, both of these are marvelous things. Both of these are great things. In fact, this is probably the most wonderful thing because this is what gives us life and joy and peace. But this is particularly difficult. This would be the sermon, the preaching, the scriptures, etc., etc. But this is the this is where the exertion comes in, where the great difficulty is. When God speaks, this is more difficult prayer. For our weaknesses and unworthiness come along and draw us back so we think, who am I that I should have the courage to lift up my eyes and raise my hands to the divine majesty where angels are and at whose nod the entire world trembles? Shall I, wretched little man that I am, say to him, this is what I want and I beg thee to give it to me? The great crowd of monks and priests has no knowledge of this, nor do they know what praying is. This is very interesting. How Luther's going to contrast true prayer from the scriptures and the agony, this prayer from the heart versus the just sort of repetitious prayer of the monastic seven hours. Although some of the godly overcome these thoughts more easily. But really efficacious and powerful prayers, which must penetrate the clouds, are certainly difficult. For I, who am ashes, dust, and full of sins, am addressing the living, eternal, and true God. Therefore, it's no wonder that he who prays trembles and shrinks back. Long ago, when I was still a monk and for the first time read these words in the canon of the Mass, Thou, therefore, most merciful Father, and also we offer to Thee, the living, the true, and the eternal God, I used to be completely stunned. And I shuddered at those words, for I used to think, with what impudence am I addressing so great a majesty when everybody should be terrified? <clears throat> uh, where did I go? Terrified when looking at or conversing with some prince or king. This is one of these stories that Luther tells of his time in the monastery. And, and, and note this, because this is important. As people look back at the Reformation, they say, well, look, Luther and all the people were terrified of God. They were, they were kind of governed by this fear of God. And so the doctrine of the gospel, law and gospel, developed out of this. But we'll remember that Luther thought this thing, but he would, he would critique the rest of the world because they didn't even have any thought of being terrified when speaking to God. But faith which relies on the mercy and the word of God, overcomes and prevails over that fear. Just as it conquered, just as it conquered it in Isaac, who despaired of all human help, for no one was able to help his barren wife. Therefore he takes heart and directs a fervent and powerful prayer to God. Such outstanding boldness and greatness of faith the flesh does not see. Now, remember, just to highlight this again, one of the things that, we, that we're talking about here in, in how Luther is reading the text is that are we reading the Scriptures with the eyes of flesh or are we reading the Scriptures with the eyes of the Spirit? So here we want to read with the eyes of faith. And we recognize that in this, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife for 20 years because she was barren. There's a lot, there's a lot of wrestling there. This is written for our sakes, those who are reading the scriptures with, uh, the, by the Holy Spirit, in order that we may be bold and confident, we may learn to pray, for the prayers of believers cannot be in vain. 
So Isaac does not pray in vain either. But as Moses says, and the Lord granted his prayer. So the Lord will not disregard our sighs and cries either. Only let us be stirred up to pray. Let us be stirred up to pray. That's probably the, the, the encouraging preaching from this text. Okay. Um, let's see. Prayers difficult. Well, this is great. Confirm. Let me just check some of the chat here. Prayers hard work says Candy. Uh, is it okay to use written prayers? Can you recommend a book? Evangelical friends disparage written prayers because they are not from the heart. The, I, I, yes, we can and should use written prayers. Uh, and I think especially we uh, should use the Psalms. This is the place to start, right? That we start with the Psalms and use those and start to pray those. This is really great. Um, uh, and we we also... So there's a, there's a strange balance, I suppose, in, um, in prayer. We have the sort of liturgical traditional prayers, which come to us from the tradition of the church. You have the idea of the ex corde prayer, which is the prayer from the heart. We should embrace fully both of those and not set them against each other. So you get the Roman Catholics despising the ex corde prayers of the evangelicals. You get the evangelicals despising the written prayers of the Catholics. We should say, no, look, this is both important. The Lord gives us written prayers, and we, we, but the prayers now also grow out of our own heart. So this is, this is a big part of it. Good. Um, I just moved everything away. Here we are. Back now. I added. Um, okay. Um, L Luther's going to dig into this Hebrew word here, noka, and it's this word that, um, uh, this means, uh, it's the word pleaded. Uh, is it the word pleaded? Yes. Um, uh, that's looking different in my little thing over here. But the Jews, it really means straightforward directly. Luther's going to say, it has to be explained in a spiritual manner, namely that he prayed uh, with his whole heart and with concentration. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to highlight this before. We, we were talking about this here. He prayed with his whole heart and with concentration on his wife's misfortune. Just as when I pray for someone, I present him to myself in the sight of my heart and see or think of nothing else but I look upon him alone in my heart. Now, this is a, a very practical thing here. When we're praying for someone, this is how Luther says that we imagine that person, we, we focus on that person, we see that person in our imagination, in our heart, and we bring them, uh, and we bring them to the Lord. And this is, uh, this is wonderful. So Isaac prayed while he had his wife before his eyes. In this way, Moses wants to point out that it was a fervent and earnest prayer in which he was not hesitant and did not roam about in his hearts and thoughts. Now, this is interesting because because uh, as I was talking to Dr. Kleinig, and he, you know, you guys know Dr. Kleinig, and he writes in his spirituality book about how he likes to let his heart roam around in prayer. So he'll start praying. And then he sort of just lets his mind wander. And he figures that this is sort of a spiritually, and I think this is right, a spiritually directed thing where sometimes the, the Lord will kind of let our imagination remember this person or think of this person. And then we say, we say a prayer for them, especially when we wake up in the middle of the night and someone is on our minds. And that means that it's almost like the Lord stirring us up to prayer, calling us to prayer. But there's another way that's what, which is what Luther is um, is uh, kind of commending to us is that we, we we have this disciplined heart, a disciplined imagination in our prayers. A prayer of this kind is praised in the case of a man who had made a bet with Bernard that he would say the Lord's prayer without any wandering thoughts. This is an old kind of. Uh, this is you, you. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but when you when you start to read the the church fathers and all these guys, um, they'll talk about the uh, the difficulty of praying the Lord's prayer perfectly. 
And all, like, I mean, Walther will talk about this. Luther will talk about this. All the old fathers talk about this. How hard it was to just pray the Lord's Prayer once, all the way through. And the, and the idea of praying it perfectly is praying it with a with a focused mind so that you don't think of something else. So that all the way through, you're right there on the on the words that you're that you're praying. I think it's kind of funny that they talk about it, but it it comes up so often in the in the um, in these conversations that it's probably something for us to take notice of. I can see the comments now. Comments on WW written daily prayers. Mm, I, what is WW, Steve? If you could clarify, that'd be great. Uh, Mark says I have such a long prayer list. I feel guilty when I drop some person or issue off of my list. I feel guilty when on a busy day I fail to pray my whole list. I, Mark, to address that problem, have divided my prayer list into seven parts for each of the petitions for each day of the week. So on Sunday, hallowed be thy name, I pray for the gift of baptism, for my godchildren, for the preaching of the word, um, thy kingdom come, on Monday, I pray for missionaries, ministries, things like this. Uh, so I've divided my prayer list into seven, so I rotate it on the week for that exact same thing. Um, okay, back to it. Isaac prayed with his wife. Oh, we said that before his eyes. Um, in this way, Moses uh, wants to point out that it was a fervent and earnest prayer. A man had a bet with Bernard that he would say the Lord's Prayer without any wandering thoughts. But since they had staked a horse, so he, can you imagine these monks? He says, I'll bet you a horse you can't pray the Lord's Prayer perfectly. <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. He was forced to confess the truth. After finishing his prayer, he confessed that while he was praying, he had not been concerned about the saddle and the bridle, whether these had to be added, or sorry, he had been concerned about the saddle and the bridle, whether these had to be added to the horse or not. <laughs> this is great. The prayer of the godly should not be like this, because this prayer is not spoken in a straightforward manner. Instead, the heart wanders now to the right and now to the left. A true and fervent prayer pres presents the case to God with great zeal and fervor, directs its attention to this matter alone and is not disturbed either by any presumption or by any doubt. So presumption would be pride, doubt would be, well, doubt, despair, fear, but simply with this kind of straightforward manner, Lord God, consider this afflicted little woman and thy promise. It neither thinks nor is concerned about anything else. And this is the unremitting, that is, the earnest and straightforward prayer of a righteous man, of which the epistle of James speaks. The prayer of the righteous, uh, in, what does it say? The prayer of the righteous uh, it helps much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There it is. Now, um, we can think of this kind of in practical terms. You know how many times there'll be you'll be talking to someone or... Uh, uh, husband and wife are talking to each other and you're distracted about something else and you're not really there. So this is the thing that Luther is getting after. So when we pray, we should not be like that. It's difficult. But I'll tell you what helps and that is distress. When you're really worried about something, when something has really captured your own heart, there is a, there is a degree of focus on that particular thing that is very helpful. So suffering helps us to pray. And then, God be praised, the Lord hears the prayer, and Rebecca, uh, this the, the wife of Jacob, for after 20 years of prayer, Rebecca conceived. This passage is outstanding and noteworthy to the highest degree. Paul discusses it in an excellent manner in the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 9, 10 to 13, which Luther will quote here. Now, we'll remember that Romans 9, Romans 9, uh, 10, and 11 have to do with the question of election um, and predestination and 
the Old Testament people, the Jewish people. And it's a pretty complicated, uh, it's a pretty complicated uh, section of Holy Scripture, uh, this section. But Paul quotes this text in that section. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might, co- might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she, Rebekah, was told, the elder will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So far, Romans 9, and that verse is from Hosea. Here, and again, let's just check out Luther's sort of exegetical attitude. I, I, this is really quite wonderful. Here, indeed, we shall gladly stand up before St. Paul and grant him tutorship <laughs> and the honor that he alone was able to explain this passage as it deserves. For we are unable to present any other or better explanation. Nevertheless, because something has to be said, we as imperfect pupils want to follow the most perfect teacher. So Paul here he's talking about. I sure, surely would never have looked at these words in this manner. Moses says, Rebecca conceived, but how? Not only physically or by the strength of nature, but the saintly patriarch Isaac procured this conception through his prayer. And this is no ordinary glory for Isaac, although so many patriarchs were still living and saw those little boys, namely Abraham and Shem and Selah and Eber, yet no mention is made of the praying of all these. To Isaac alone, as the heir of the promise, the glory is assigned that he prayed, that is, that he performed a priestly duty by placing his hands on Rebekah in accordance with the rite that was customary for priests. So that so that the, the honor here is given to Isaac in this prayer and this priestly work, and the, the Lord gives the gift of conception to Rebekah because Isaac has prayed for her. Now, the one of the questions that Luther is wrestling with all through the um, the Genesis commentary is who is the priest and who is the preacher, and it's it's quite it's quite wonderful simply to note that I mean of course Abraham is a priest and Shem and Selah and Eber and Luther's discussed them before and will discuss them soon. We're kind of, we're kind of come upon that. It, it, it's this question of who's the preacher? Where's the word of God coming from? But here we notice that Isaac is taken in, is given the, this priestly role of intercession, and um, and the glory is assigned to him, that Isaac prayed, and the Lord answered his prayer. Consequently, the conception is not the result of flesh or nature. God wanted it to take place through the prayer of the saintly patriarch, as the result of his faith, hope, and love. Those always go together: faith, hope, and love. And so the 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 conception of of Jacob and Esau is the Lord answering prayer. Is this saying? At first time I read this, I thought, is this is is Luther saying that this was like a a virgin birth or something like that? No, I don't think he's saying that. But he said, look, what is the cause of the conception here? There's always lots of causes, and so Isaac was a part of the cause. We we know Isaac is the father, for example, so that the flesh was involved, but the chief. Um, the chief cause is that the Lord granted his plea. The Lord answered his prayer. Uh, consequently, this passage teaches the same thing that Paul teaches in his epistle to the Romans, where he distinguishes birth as a result of the flesh, that is a result of creation, from birth which is a result of the spirit, spiritual birth. For God preserved the former after Adam's fall, even though the nature had become corrupted through sin and the devil, who had told Adam to become equal to God through the same fall through which Lucifer fell from heaven. Nevertheless, God did not deprive nature of procreation, but permitted the godly as well as the ungodly to procreate. The only thing he wanted to point out was that it was not enough to be born into this world of the flesh, but that over and above the birth that remained in nature the rebirth and renewal of regeneration, Titus 3, through the Holy Spirit is necessary. To prove this, Paul makes use of this passage concerning Esau and Jacob and of the earlier one concerning Isaac and Ishmael. Both were born according to the flesh and the first birth, 
but neither would have come into the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of man if Isaac had not been appointed heir through the new birth. The same thing is true in the case of Jacob. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause and see if this makes sense, because this is a little bit dense. But So, so what Luther is, is noticing, what Paul is doing, is Paul is paying careful attention to this passage here that says that Rebekah conceived and bore a child because of the prayer of Isaac, and in that verse, Luther sees the difference between the birth of the flesh and the birth of the Spirit. Make sense? Okay. Ah, so, uh, so, so looking at the, I'm back on the chat here. So Steve mentioned the WW, this is the, um, the Around the Word devotions that we, St. Paul mails out. You can find those Around the Word devotions at whatdoesthismean.org, and we mail out devotions every week, and it's a, includes a, uh, the a prayer for the week, the collect for the week. It includes a psalm. It includes a, a daily devotion, and at the end of that daily devotion is a one-sentence prayer. What we're trying to do with those one-sentence prayers is, in some ways, model how prayer grows out of the Lord's Word, and this is then also for us, so that we can um, we can know how, when as we are reading and studying the Scriptures, that we're turning that reading into prayer. So the Lord speaks to us, and then we take those prayers and we send them back to the Lord. There's a great there's a, a number of ways to do this. One of the patterns is that we say, well, what is this teaching me? How does this teach me to, to confess? How does this give me wisdom? How does this give me promises? And we weave the Scripture into a fourfold prayer, things like that. Uh, so that's one of, that's a, uh, so those are great prayers, and also hopefully they're helpful model prayers. Um, Dan says, funny how Jacob had to go through the same thing. Exactly, We're, and we'll get to that. In, a, in probably in four or five years. <laughs> How are we doing? Okay, good. Let's uh, let's hit a couple. Uh, let me see here. I um, I'm gonna skip down a little here. Uh, I'm skipping a page or, or two. Um, there's a lot that Luther has to say about this, but um, th- let's let's pick it up here. Therefore, the strongest argument that can be opposed to the previous one is to be found in the fact that God made a distinction between Isaac and Ishmael and between Jacob and Esau, who were born in the same way of Abraham and Isaac. Nevertheless, Ishmael, no matter how much he desires it, cannot be the heir. No, the seed of the promise, which is the, which has the call, and over and above the first birth has the second, and regeneration is given the preference. So that these twins... Well, I shouldn't say Isaac and Ishmael are not twins, but these two boys and then these two twins are both born naturally, and yet the Lord is going to make a distinction between the two. And with Isaac and Ishmael, it, we, it might be because we have, we have um, Sarah versus Hagar, but remember Sarah has the promise and Hagar does not. Uh, Paul makes much of this in the discussion in Galatians of the analogy. But look, Jacob and Esau have the same mom, have the same dad, and yet the Lord is going to distinguish between the two. So they have the same birth of the flesh, but not that they have a different birth of spirit and promise. And this, and this is the well, this is the source of perpetual war from the beginning of the world to the end. Luther earlier talked about how th- this is the source of the, f- the fight between Cain and Abel. The very first murder was a martyrdom. It was a religious war. Not about trivialities, but about the glorious title church, or the people of God, or the kingdom of heaven, and eternal life. Thus today, this today is what, it was probably 1546 or something? 1540, 30, maybe, yeah, 1540? Anyway, I'm not sure. The, today is not today. It's a long time ago today. It's Luther. But there's really nothing different. Thus, today we are at variance with the Church of the Pope, which wants to be the people of God and to have possession of the kingdom and the priesthood. They boast that they alone are the church of God, which acknowledges God as the Father and worships him properly. 
They condemn and persecute us as heretics and the church of the devil. This is what it means that the infants are at, uh, are at variance before they were born. From the beginning, there's a twofold church in the world, just as the seed is twofold, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, which contend and are at variance with, with each other because of the title church. So, so that these struggling together, and we'll, we'll get to more on this because this is a key thing, but this is just basically a, uh, the idea of how the history of the conflict of the whole world is. It's a theological conflict. When we see wars and rumors of wars, um, we often don't think of them as theological at the root, but oftentimes we find that they in fact are. Paul certainly handed down an exceedingly clear and powerful dialect when he pointed out the difference between birth and the call. Where there is birth alone, there's condemnation. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, not of blood. Paul says something else. Because of his call, she was told, Romans 9. That is, the word of God and the promise are necessary. Over and above the... Let me highlight this. this is great. Over and above the creature... He who wants to rule and be a son of God must hear him, not as the God who creates only, but especially as the God who calls. If the first birth were sufficient, why would we need God? The Turks are most honorable people, very wise, very religious. By means of the strictest discipline, they are preserving the kingdom which they have acquired through great exertion. Therefore, if the people of God were like the Turkish people, nothing more would be required." Besides, they are adorned by God with wealth, wisdom, glory, reason, very brilliant victories. What else is there amongst the Turk than the first birth? For reason is born of a woman, and to reason belongs wisdom, civil rights, discipline, and laws. This is an interesting take on reason here. Above all these people, Holy Scripture says that they are lost and condemned before God. Why? Why? Because they have the first birth, but they don't have the second they don't have the call. Remember how Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Okay. In their time, the Jews had blood and glory of the flesh, uh, but the Jews gloried in the blood, that is, they were bo- that they were born of fathers and prophets. They had the glory of the flesh, the kingdom of power, religion, and hypocrisy to boot. Therefore, they were vainglorious in every way, not only because of the cause, but also because of the effect. If man does what he can of himself, he will be saved, they say. In fact, we say it that uh, God helps those who help themselves, etc., etc. But this is by no means the case. I don't know why I highlighted this in green, but I think it was because I thought this was very, very important. So let's see. (laughs) This is by no means the case. The call is required. That is, the word. But if the first birth were enough, why would we have need of the word? Why does God call from the east to the west? Are we not righteous, saintly, and sensible men? (laughs) But in opposition to all this, God says, This is what I want. All flesh is grass. All its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades but the word of the Lord endures forever so that no one may glory in his flesh and blood, but may acquire the renewal which takes place when God calls. Otherwise, all glory, both of the cause and of the effect, will be vain and worthless, and a people that trusts in this glory alone will be condemned eternally. This is phenomenal. The thing that matters is the Lord's word. When the, there's teaching of this kind, the Jews rage and almost go crazy. That's what well, one of the big uh, things of the New Testament, because remember when Jesus says, uh, when the Son makes you free, you will be free, and they say, we, have, we are children of Abraham. We've never been slaves of anybody. There's this boasting of the flesh that is native to all of us. This, this boasting of the flesh, th- this idea that, well, r- remember, when you just ask somebody, hey, 
um, are you going to go to heaven? They say, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a good person. It's this idea of our own goodness sticks to our sinful flesh. It's like a, there's a, we talked last week about the little monk that lives in us. There's a little Pharisee that lives in all of us. And, um, and we boast in our own goodness. I have it. You have it. Everybody has it. We, we are masters at self-justification. And so this idea that the flesh does not matter, but only, um, but only the call of God, this is important. It's important for, this should, what, what, I mean, I, I've been sort of rehashing some of the stuff that we had to go through last summer with the, with the race riots, right? This should really help inform and exclude from any sort of Christian imagination, any sort of superiority according to race. That's pure fleshism, pure fleshism, and it's despicable. But also, even the, the national pride that we have, we should, we should all be, in some ways, patriotic. It's part of our vocation as citizen. Whatever state to which we belong, we want to support, as long as it's a godly state, insofar as we can. But that is a very limited support, and it stands way below our support for the kingdom of God. We are citizens not of this earth, but of heaven, from which we await our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this idea of glorying in the flesh, but it's, so it's our works, but it's everything else. This has to be put down because it is the call of God which gives us, um, which gives us hope and peace. Okay, a little bit more, and then we'll, I'm going to open it up to the. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Let's get this paragraph here. I got a highlight in it. Consequently, I skipped down a couple more pages. Consequently, consequently, we are at variance, just as it happened in the entire world from the beginning to the end. So Luther's saying we're fighting against the Pope, but this fight is nothing new. We say they are not the Church, for they glory only in the first birth. They, on the other hand, condemn us who believe the God who calls and promises. We, uh, this would be the Wittenbergers, the evangelicals, we look for salvation from the source, from that source. Who will be the arbiter and the judge here? This text. Not those who are of the flesh, but those who are of faith. The call and the promise are required to obtain salvation. If the question is asked whether a Turk will be saved, the answer is he will not. I mean, again, can a Turk be saved? Yes, but not by his Turkishness, but if he believes in Jesus, this is the point. Yet here there are wisdom, a most respectable life, manifold worship, respect and obedience toward the government, an outstanding military discipline. Indeed, they are here. But to what do all these things pertain? To the first birth. Therefore, he must be condemned and cannot be a child of the kingdom, for the call and the rebirth are lacking. And he wants to be saved through his first birth, which is corrupt, unless it is restored through re regeneration. So this is the hope of the world. Restoration through regeneration, baptism. Therefore, it is sure that the Turk is not the church, nor are the Jews, for they do not have the call, although neither the cause nor the effect is lacking, as it has been stated above. Thus, the church of the Pope is not the church, because they walk in the first birth and presume to obtain salvation as the result of works. But where, over and above the first birth, God added the call, as Paul says, Romans 9, 11 to 12, because of his call, she was told, there you will find the church. The Romans were the authors of very fine rites and laws, thinking of the ancient Roman Empire, as the poet praises them. Remember, O Roman, to rule the people. I, I, let's see who this poet is. Virgil, the Aeneid. But, uh, but they are nothing else than reason, which is born of the flesh through a woman and a man. This is altogether unprofitable and dead before God. Consequently, no... Uh, oh, physician. Consequently, consequently, no papist or Turk or monk or jurist or physician will save himself. For wherever there, whatever there is in the entire world in the way of very fine and useful things is all condemned by one name, namely, because it is flesh and the glory of the flesh. 
Therefore, this teaching is of the true church. We are not only created and born of flesh, but God sent his word and calls us. That is, he proclaims the remission of sins and the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ. If we believe this, we are the church. See it? Okay. Now let me um let me see what uh uh what you guys have to say about this. In fact, I well, I think this is probably a good spot to stop and and open it up for questions. So but so let me kind of highlight the, the difference here. That that in this in the in the prayer of Isaac for Rebecca and in and in the conception of Jacob and Esau in answer to Isaac's prayer Luther understands and sees this distinction between that which is born of the flesh and that which is born of the spirit or born of the word. And this is the way that we look at through the whole world. It's not that we despise the things that are born of the flesh. I mean, after all, Luther says, look, the, the people that are born of the flesh have reason and have all these other good things. But it does us no good when it comes to standing before the Lord. That is only by faith and by calling. So that there's nothing to boast in, nothing for us to boast in at all, nothing for anybody to boast in, but only the Lord who calls. So with that in mind, let's pray, and then we'll talk about it some more. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks that you have called us by the gospel, enlightened us with your gifts, sanctified and kept us in the true faith. We pray that you would give us your wisdom, your peace, and your spirit to see and rejoice in these glorious things through your word. For we ask this all through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.